Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is an interesting one entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And this is lesson number seven in that series for May 15 of 2021, entitled Covenant at Sinai. So I guess you can probably get an idea what we're going to be talking about. As usual, we'd like to begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is to study your word, to think about you, to invite you to take charge of our thoughts as we seek to represent you correctly to those who might be listening in. Be close to each one of us. Help us to draw nearer to you as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Try to grasp all that God offers us. You ever tried to think all the things that God offers of us? And what does he expect from us in return? What makes us eligible for this marvelous exhibition of divine grace? Did we do something marvelous to, 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 to you know, deserve that? And how is it supposed to impact us? Could it really deliver, deliver us from sin as it delivered the Israelites from Egypt? The Bible describes the bondage of Israel to the Egyptians as extending over 430 years. Now there's two or three things I want to make, up, make very clear at the beginning of this lesson, things that a lot of people don't understand. And the first one is right now. About a careful review of all the details makes it clear that half of that time, half of the 430 years, or about 215 years, was the time from when Abraham was called out of Ur of the Chaldees until Jacob died in Egypt. That was the first half of those 430 years. The other 215 years included their time in Egypt itself, with some of that time in slavery. So the amount of time in slavery, remember Joseph was held in high repute there in Egypt because it saved them from all that drought and all that stuff. So there was quite a long time until they began to multiply so rapidly that the Egyptians started worrying about it. So the period of slavery was probably no more than about 100 years. I mean, that's, that's one year is too much, but I'm just saying it's, they certainly weren't in slavery for 430 years. How did that extended time in Egypt impact their thinking about God? What did God need to do to win them back? In the early chapters of Exodus, we read the story of the birth of Moses, his protection from being killed as an infant. Remember all the baby boys were supposed to be thrown into the river? His time with his humble Hebrew parents, about 12 years more or less and then his time being raised in the palace as his son of Pharaoh. It looked like everything had, been come, had come to naught after killing an Egyptian. Moses fled to the land of Midian. But God sent him there to be trained for his real job, which began at the age of 80. <laughs> that makes some of us who are getting closer to that age feel a little more comfortable. Maybe God still has a plan for us, huh? When Moses returned to Egypt and in cooperation with Aaron, predicted all of those plagues that fell on Egypt, they were finally able to get the children of Israel released from Egyptian bondage. But they soon discovered that it was easier to get Israel out of Egypt than it was to get Egypt out of Israel. Look at some verses that talk about that challenge. Jim? Exodus 19.4, you saw what I did, the Lord said, me. You saw what I, the Lord did to the Egyptians, and now I carried you as an eagle carries her young on her wings, and brought you here to, to me. American Bible Society, 1992. And, and then... Uh, but they soon discovered... I'm sorry, here I've got... I'm sorry, go ahead. You want to do Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy, okay. Deuteronomy 10 to 12, it's gonna be 32, 10 to 12. He found them wandering through the desert, a desolate windswept wilderness. He protected them and cared for them as he would protect himself. Like an eagle teaching its young to fly, catching them safely on, his, on its spreading wings, the Lord kept Israel from falling. 
The Lord alone led his people without the help of a foreign God. Also the Good News Bible. Deuteronomy 1, 29 to 31. But I said, don't be afraid of those people. The Lord your God will lead you and he will fight for you. you just as you saw him do in Egypt and in the desert, you saw how he brought you safely all the way to this place just as a father carry, carry, would carry his son. I'm going to interrupt for a second. <clears throat> this is Deuteronomy, the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy consists of three sermons that, I mean, probably shouldn't just call them sermons. They were d directions, uh, final, the final words from Moses, at, down there, uh, standing on the plain, I mean, camped on the plain of Moab, looking across the flooded um, Jordan River at, at Jericho on the other side, and he's given these final instructions. So he says, you've come all this way, you're now down on the plain of Moab here, ready to cross the Jordan River, and God has brought you this far. And what else did God have to say about that? Hosea 11, 1, the Lord said, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and I called him out of Egypt as my son. Good, good news, Bible. Wow. Now, I'd like to go back at, the, at Deuteronomy here. He says, I will fight for you. Yeah. Okay, it was God going to do it. They didn't need to, but yeah. the, the history shows that they liked the fight. At least. Yeah, unfortunately, and that, that's exactly, and that's a really important point. Thank you, Jim, for mentioning that. God told them repeatedly, just let me do it, just let me do it. But they said, oh no, if you do it, we won't get the credit for winning the battles with our swords. Yeah. I mean, serious, can you believe they were willing to sacrifice their lives in order to have that, quote, fame that they were powerful soldiers instead of letting God do it? I mean, and we know, if you look through the Old Testament, every time they went to, to battle without God's guidance, it was a terrible disaster. Yes. And every time they went to battle with God's guidance, under His, under his care, they, they, they sometimes would come back with having, without having lost a single person. I mean, uh, Deuteronomy, that, that was Deuteronomy, yeah. but that, which means the second telling, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, in his Exodus uh, 14, 14, Jehovah will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. Yes. So we have a, a reason. It, it's not that a one-time one thing. It's, it's he, I mean, that was what God. That was God's plan. Yeah. I mean, if we had time, we would go back to Exodus 23 and compare Deuteronomy 20. And God says, "I'm going to send the hornets ahead of you. I'm going to send. I'm going to drive out the enemies and so forth." Like. Another way to, to translate that uh, I, I've been studying uh, uh, with some help. And that is, not that God wanted to kill anybody. He oh. wanted to, to make of no effect their gods. Yeah, exactly. It was, it was of, of the, in the promised land. Yeah, that's what it says. At the end of that thing, please don't worship their gods. Yeah. Destroy them. Get rid of them. You know, yeah. It's, but then in Deuteronomy, finally when, when they said, well, we like to use our swords. Yeah. God says, well, okay, go in there and kill everybody. If that's the really, really the way you want to do it. Well, why did God allow the Israelites to go through that terrible, fiery furnace experience in Egypt? What might have happened if they had stayed in Palestine? Have you ever thought about this? Jacob's sons were marrying Canaanite women already, and they probably would have just faded into Canaanite society. But God had a plan, and I want you to think about this. Very few people, I, I, I've never heard anyone talk about this, but I'm sure some have. Earlier, when Abraham fled to Egypt because of a drought and lied about his wife, he was finally escorted out of Egypt. A law was passed that said Egyptians should not associate with those who herd cattle and sheep. And I'm quoting from Mellon White, Abraham had been greatly favored by the king. Even now, Pharaoh would permit no harm to be done him or his, or his company, but ordered a guard to conduct them in safety out of his dominions. At this time, laws were made prohibiting the Egyptians from intercourse or interaction with foreign shepherds and any such familiarity as eating or drinking with them. Pharaoh saw in this stranger, that is Abraham, a man whom God had heaven, have, the God of heaven honored, and he feared to have in his kingdom one who was so evidently under divine favor. Think about that. God was afraid to have him around. 
Should Abraham remain in Egypt, his increasing wealth and honor would be likely to excite the envy of covetousness or covetousness of the Egyptians, and some injury might be done him, for which the monarch would be held responsible, and which might again bring judgments upon the royal house. Patriarchs and Prophets 130 through 131. Now I want you to think about the implications of that. Egyptians were not allowed to associate with shepherds. shepherds yes. When Jacob and his family came to Egypt, because of this law, that was passed because of Abraham's problems, they were forced to remain separate from the Egyptians. That preserved their separate identity. Did God arrange for that experience with Abraham because he knew what would happen in the future? I don't have a whole lot of argument with that position. That Patterns of Evidence uh, yes. movie that was yeah. done by, uh, is quite insightful. It's up yeah. in the, the Goshen area. Yeah. And uh, it's yeah. really quite. Uh, yeah. So how does God treat us even in our day? Gary, maybe you could take that. I'm uh, using Psalm 103, verses 13 and 14. As a father is kind to his children, so the Lord is kind to those who honor him. He knows what we are made of. He remembers that we are dust. And that's from the Good News Bible. Look, look at God's first order, offer of a covenant to the children of Israel. Could you read that also? Using Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 to 7. In brackets, God said to Moses, So tell the Israelites that I say to them, I am the Lord, I will re rescue you and set you free from your slavery to the Egyptians. I will raise my mighty arm to bring terrible punishment upon them and I will save you. I will make you my own people and I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord your God when I set you free from slavery in Egypt. That's from the Good News Bible. Now you notice that uh, when I put this down here, I thought we should emphasize all the eyes. Yes. You see them there. Yes. So what does this? What do you see in this statement? Who is doing all the promising? God. God did all the promising. There are two great salvation stories in the writings of Moses: the story of Noah. Noah and to the story of the Exodus from Egypt. What kind of offer was God making to the children of Israel? When he offered to redeem them, what did that imply? The Hebrew word goel implied that God approached the children of Israel as if he was a relative, buying them back from slavery and bondage in Egypt. Now, I, we need to say a little bit about that. In ancient times, there were no local banks. You couldn't go to the bank and get a mortgage. You couldn't go to a friend and, and, and borrow some money to pay off your debts. If you got into debt, the only, op the only option you had was if you happened to have some, some possessions, you could sell those, or you sold yourself or your children into slavery for a period of, well, it's, it's bonded indenture kind of thing, for a period of time to pay that debt. So if someone, one of your relatives would come along and say, well, I don't want my cousin or my nephew or my niece or whoever, my brother in bondage, I will pay what he owes and get him out. That person who would pay that money and get him out was called the goel, okay? Redeemer. Redeemer, yeah, exactly. So when he offered to redeem, the what, redeem them, what did that imply? The Hebrew word goel implied that God approached the children of Israel as if he was a relative, <coughs> buying them back from slavery and bondage in Egypt. Jim? The word redeem in verse 6 of <laughs> Exodus 6 refers to a member of a family buying back or ransoming another member of the family, especially when that member was in slavery for debt or about to go into slavery. Israel apparently had no earthly relative to redeem her, but God was now Israel's relative, her kinsman redeemer. That's from Bernard L. Ram in the book, His Way Out yeah. in Glendale. And it's quoted in the Bible study guide. What does it mean to say that God ransoms us? Are we bought back from slavery to sin? What price had to be paid to do that? Does that say anything about how God views us? When a price has to be paid, it usually is paid to someone, 
To whom was that price paid? Did God have to pay the devil to get us back? I don't think so. Well, it, one thing, it was not a commercial transaction. No. no. And so it, it uh, but unfortunately, maybe the limitation of language uh, to, to express that, that uh, thing, but it's not, most definitely was not, Jesus did not pay a tenth uh, pay to some tax master or a yeah. commercial. In the early years after Christ, life here on this earth and after he ascended to heaven, the next 200 to 300 years or so, there, there was a common theory of the atonement or a theory of salvation that went like this. That when we sinned, back in the beginning, Adam and Eve, we sold ourselves, the whole human race, into Satan's bondage. And so a whole period of time goes by, thousands of years go by, and God goes to the devil and he says, I have a deal for you. I will offer you my son in exchange for all of the human race. And the devil had always wanted to be in the place of God's son, so he says, okay, if you let me take charge of the son and I will take his place, I'll be happy to give all these people to you. So he sells all the people to, to God, and then Satan discovers after he's done that, that he can't hold on to say uh, can't hold on to the body of Christ, and so God wins the great controversy by uh, deceiving the devil. Is that call it a trickster in a way. Yes. And Islam is all all it in Islam is known as a great trickster. Uh huh. I'm, well, look 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 it up. I'm yeah. not making that up. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Well, yeah, no, so what what we're really saying there is that it. God didn't pay anything to anybody. He paid, he, he went through what it actually cost to, to set us free, to demonstrate the truth about himself, about Satan and so forth. Actually, what, this is what it actually cost him to do that. Carrie, we wanna. Um, using Mark this time, chapter 10, verse 45. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. That's from the Good News Bible. Moving on, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 6. Who gave himself to redeem everyone? That was the proof at the right time that God wants everyone to be saved. Again, from the Good News Bible. Revelation 5, verse 9, they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to break open its seals, for you were killed, and by your sacrificial death you, you bought for God. People from every tribe, language, nation, and race. Good news, Bible. Okay, so again, we're going to ask, well, we've got one more verse. Let's go ahead and look at that one. Exodus chapter 3, verse 8, And so I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians and to bring them out of Egypt to a spacious land on which is rich and fertile, in which the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. And I'm sorry, one more. John 1, 14. The Word became a human being and, full of grace and truth, lived among us. He saw His glory, the glory which He received as the Father's only Son. Okay, so what's implied by the idea that God came down to rescue us? Does... We were in trouble, I guess. We're in trouble. And why are we in trouble? can't keep on the straight and narrow. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, reviewing the story of Exodus, we notice three main events. One, the Exodus itself. Two, God's offer of establishing a covenant with his people, Israel. And three, the building of the tabernacle sanctuary. So if you were to overlook the, I mean, overview the chapters from Exodus 19 to 24, now they're out of Egypt, they're camped at the foot of Mount Sinai, and you, you see what God interchanged, what his interchange was with them. It would go something like this. One, Israel's arrival in the encampment at Sinai after being delivered by the Lord. That's Exodus 19, 1 and 2. Then got to God's proposal of a covenant with Israel, Exodus 19, 3 through 6. Three, Israel's response in acceptance of the covenant, Exodus 19, 7 and 8. And you remember in Exodus 19, 8, what did they say to God? Oh, no. do Everything it. that God says we will do. No problem, right? 
Prep, number four, preparations for formally receiving the covenant, Exodus 19, 9 through 25. They had to get ready and they had to mark, up, mark a boundary around the mountain and all that sort of stuff. Five, proclamation of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 21 to 17. We know that passage very well. Six, Moses as covenant mediator. And there's a very interesting verse I'd like us to look at just briefly here in Exodus 20, starting with verse 18. And let me make that a little bit larger here. It's a little easier to read. Uh, and I, I'm going to read it from the, the King James Version here. And you'll see some Hebrew words there to, to, you can see the actual Hebrew if you can read it. Of course, the Hebrew is written backwards so it can, so it can fit with our English. They read from left, from right to left, and we read from left to right. So, and all the people saw the thundering and the lightning. This is right at the end of the Ten Commandments, and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said unto Moses, Speak thou with us, and we will hear, but let not God speak with us, lest we die. So Moses said unto the people, Fear not, for God has come to prove you. And, uh, uh, and that his fear may be before you, your faces, that you sin not. And the people stood afar off, and Moses drew near unto God, and so forth. So, God, fear not, but the fear of God is in you. So that's a little bit, that's something like a contradiction, doesn't it? Why does it say that in one verse? Well, if you know what they got, they... King, or King James translators, they like to mix it up with different uh, yeah. metaphors. So. Well, the real answer to that, of course, is that the word fear in the Bible has a huge yes. spectrum of meanings, all the way from being, you know, just totally abject terror, all the way to honor and respect and reverence. So Moses is saying, don't be terrorized, be respectful. That, that's all that means. It, it shouldn't be a problem for us to understand that. So when you see the term, uh, the, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, is to be in awe of God, is, the, is, is just a start in your right. understanding. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well then, covenant principles are spelled out in Exodus 20, 22 verses 23, 22. And then finally, ratification of the covenant in Exodus 24, 1 through 18. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. It is interesting to note in Exodus 19.8 that the children of Israel promised God, we already mentioned this, that whatever he said, they would do. That promise was repeated in Exodus 24, verse 3. First of all, Moses spoke it to them, and they said, yes, whatever the God says, we will do it. And then Moses wrote it down, and then he read it to them. Whatever the God says, we will do it. Okay? God also spelled out in some detail what he expected of the children of Israel. He reinforced it by appearing himself, although shrouded in the cloud, on the top of Mount Sinai. I've had the privilege of climbing one of the mountains that they sometimes think is Mount Sinai. It was quite an interesting experience, a beautiful, great experience. Uh, more and more scholars are questioning whether that mountain in the southern tip of the Sinai Desert was the real Mount Sinai. But um, nevertheless, try to imagine yourself, here you are, a, a people who are recently ex-slaves, you traveled to a desert, you've had to, God is now giving you food and water every day, being, you're sustaining you, and all of a sudden this cloud with black cloud with lightning shooting out of it and that kind of stuff descends on the mountain and the whole place shakes. Think about a real earthquake, you know, yes. and the people are down there with the faces in the dirt, you know, well, I don't know, would, might you be slightly afraid? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that would be a likely, a likely possibility. Jim, Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verses 15 to 18. Moses went up Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it. The dazzling light of the Lord's presence came down on the mountain. To the Israelites, the light looked like a fire burning on top of the mountain. The cloud covered the mountain for six days. And on the seventh day, the Lord called to Moses from the cloud. Moses went up the mountain into the cloud. There he stayed for 40 days and nights. Good. Okay. Now I want you to think about this for a moment. 
40 days he's gone. Okay? They're in the, they're, they're, they've left Egypt. They have gotten out of Egypt because of all those plagues and so forth. And they're in a terror. They're, they're headed for the promised land, right? What are we waiting for? We're headed for the promised land. And Moses, our leader, disappears into the fire. Yeah. Are we going to see him ever again? I wondered occasionally, <laughs> did they have uh, volcanoes back then? Well, there were no, vo no like volcanoes that. in that area. Yeah. That we know about, anyway. Um, but, I mean, you could, uh, you could understand why they, if they would start saying, you know, we don't know what's happened to this Moses. A little jumpy. <laughs> How well do you think the children of Israel understood what was involved in that covenant between themselves and God? Did any of them besides Moses and maybe Aaron understand the implications of what they were told? Not very deeply, I don't think. No. Or was this just a sandbox illustration of God's plans? I mean, how do we teach young children about the stories of the Bible? We have little characters that sit in the sandbox or we put them up on a board and they, they sit there like this and the children learn something. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a story told about the little boy that was a holy terror and his mother decided he have to do something to help this kid. And so she decided to take him to send him to Sunday school. She didn't want to go to church herself, but she thought maybe if he went to Sunday school, he would learn something that he'd be a little bit easier, a little bit more manageable at least. So she took him to Sunday school, dropped him off, waited for the service. Well, he, she came back when the service was over, picked him up and so she wondered how her experiment was working. So she said to the little boy, uh, <clears throat> what did you learn today in Sunday school? Oh, he says it was a great story. Moses was a great general. He led his people down to the, to the, Red, the, the Red Sea and he got, got in his walkie-talkie and he called out the Army Corps of Engineers and they threw up a pontoon bridge and the people marched across on the pontoon bridge. They got to the other side. And when they got to the other side, the enemy came chasing after them and they got right out there in the middle on the pontoon bridge. Moses pushed a button and the whole thing exploded and that was the end of the Egyptians. <laughs> <laughs> and his mother, his mother said, is that really what the teacher told you? And the little boy looked down a little bit like this and he said, well, no, but if I told the story the way you, she told it, you wouldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you, you could see how some of this kind of stuff would, I mean, think of the experience that these people had been through already. You know, you wake up the next morning, you wonder what kind of craziness are we going to see today? Yeah. What well, is important to notice that immediately after the encounter at Mount Sinai, Moses was given instructions for the building of the tabernacle sanctuary. The children of Israel spent several months at the foot of Mount Sinai, almost a year, being instructed by Moses and building the sanctuary. Well, at the end of the 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, Moses gave some final instructions to the people of Israel. At that point, do you think they better understood the relationship that God wanted to have with them? Carrie, can you do that for us? Uh, I'm reading chapter 29 in the book of Deuteronomy, verses 10 to 15. Today you are standing in the presence of the Lord your God. All of you, your leaders and officials, your men, women and children, and the foreigners who live among you and cut wood and carry water for you. You are here today to enter into this covenant that the Lord your God is making you and to accept its obligations so that the Lord may now confirm you as his people and be your God as he promised you and your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are not the only ones with whom the Lord is making this covenant with its obligations. He is making it with all of us who stand here in his presence today and also with our descendants who are not yet born. That's from the Good News Bible. Okay. Now, let's just look real quickly at Exodus 19, 5 and 6 again. Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine. How much is his? The whole earth is mine. But you will be my chosen people, a people dedicated to me alone. You will serve me as priests. Okay? So that's what he's referring to. In what sense were the children of Israel supposed to be a kingdom of priests? A holy nation? 
What does that imply? What are the priests supposed to do in a, in a nation? Be an example for the very Okay, least. and carry out. Communicate. Yeah. yeah. A, a message. Teach. Yes. Teach, yeah. They were the teachers as well. So, um, notice carefully that they were expected to do their part. They were to obey. God did not foist on them a collection of commands without asking any, anything on their part. Paul and his masterpiece on the plan of salvation, uh, which we call the Romans, makes these comments about our relationship to the law and God. Jim? Romans 3, 19 to 26. Now we know that everything in the law applies to those who live under the law. In order to stop all human excuses and bring the whole world under God's judgment. For no one is put right in God's sight by doing what the law requires. What the law does is make people know that they have sinned. But now God's way of putting people right with himself has been revealed. It has nothing to do with, the, with law, even though the law of Moses and the prophets gave their witness to it. God put people right through their faith through their faith in Jesus Christ. God does this to all who believe in Christ because there is no difference at all. Everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. But by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Jesus, excuse me, through Christ Jesus who set them set them free or sets them free. God offered him so that by his blood he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through the, their faith in him. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. This is a really important, these two verses, 25 and 26, are very important verses in the Bible because they are the only place in the entire Bible where one of the Bible writers specifically tries to explain why Jesus had to die. Okay, so listen to it again, really carefully. Could you start with 25 again? Sure. God offered him so that by his blood he should become the means by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. In the past he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Okay, we don't have time to discuss that in great detail right, right now, but if you notice carefully in that verse, it says the reason for Jesus coming and dying three times is to tell the truth about God. And then finally it says, oh yes, and, and to put people right as well. So where's the emphasis? On teaching. The, the character of God and on teaching, yeah. Notice carefully that God apparently overlooked men's former sins. That's what it says. There was a much more important thing that he needed to accomplish. That was to demonstrate his own righteousness in the eyes of the onlooking universe as well as, as, well as in the eyes of us humans. And how was that view of God's righteousness supposed to impact us? Carrie? Romans 6 verses 1 and 2. What shall we say then? Should we continue to live in sin so that God's grace will increase? Certainly not. We have died to sin. How then can we go on living in it? That's from the Good News Bible. Romans 7, 7. Shall we say then that the law itself is sinful? Of course not. But it was the law that made me know what sin is. If the law had not sinned, do not desire what, the, what belongs to someone else, I would not have known such a desire. Good News Bible. Revelation 14, verse 12. This calls for endurance on the part of God's people, those who obey God's commandments and are faithful to Jesus. Good okay, news. so now we come to Ellen White's comment about that. We do not earn salvation by our obedience. For salvation is the free gift of God to be received by faith. But obedience is the fruit of faith. Steps to Christ, page 61. So which comes first, faith or obedience? Faith has to come first, and then obedience is the fruit 
of that faith. But you could also put in, a, if the word translated as obedience is a willingness to listen, yeah. then that a person becomes willing to listen based upon some experience with it. Yeah. And then, then they can enforce or reinforce their faith or become persuaded of the truth about God. Mm -hmm. So what did God realistically expect of the Israelites? Was he expecting a spiritual, intellectual, even moral response? What form of obedience is God asking of us today? Are we to witness to the truth about God? So if so, to whom are we to witness? Well, and isn't, isn't that, that part of witnessing, isn't that something like being a priest? Mm -hmm. You have you, you have to learn what the truth is and, and attempt to, to share it with others. What, what many people may not recognize is that while the priests would officiate in the services in the synagogue on Sabbath, they spent the week teaching the kids. Yeah. They were the school teachers. Okay. So were the children of Israel just frightened into promising obedience? Romans 9, 31 and 32, while God's people who were seeking a law that would put them right with God did not find it. This is, this is a Pharisee of the Pharisees, someone who had tried to do this all his life until, be, until that Damascus Road experience. It didn't work, he says. And why not? Because they did not depend on faith, but on what they did. And so they stumbled over the stumbling stone. That and then, kind of like a, a, a works kind of, type yeah, of experience, wasn't it? Exactly. Well, I mean, how would you describe the Pharisees? Were they a little hung Two up on works? Lactories and Two faced. You know. Two. They fasted two days a week? Man. Romans 10, verse 3, for being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. That's from the New Revised Standard Version. And then Hebrews 4, 1 and 2, now God has offered us the promise we may receive that rest he spoke about. Let us take care then that none of you will be found to have failed to receive that promised rest. For we have heard the good news just as they did. They heard the message, but it did them no good because when they heard it, they did not accept it with faith. What would that mean? What does it mean to accept something with faith? Well, maybe I've heard they didn't become, had not become persuaded. They were convinced maybe, but mm -hmm. they weren't really persuaded, like they finally figured it out on their own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they, they didn't see that this was, they saw it as a collection of things to do. Deeds to be done, sins to be shunned, as opposed to, I, I need a closer relationship with God. Yeah. Okay? In a previous lesson, we talked about faith. Faith is just a relationship with God as with a friend. That's what God wants from us. So what is the relationship between faith and works? The Bible repeatedly suggests that we are judged by our works. How can we be saved by faith but judged by works? Does that make any sense? Jim? Isaiah 53, 6. All of us were like sheep that were lost, each of us going his own way. But the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. So what does that mean? What what did we deserve? What did we deserve by our? What do we deserve by our by our sinning? We get, there's a consequence of of, of actions and. No. Uh, what did God say back in Genesis two? It's in and in, in Romans six twenty three. Yeah. Sin leads to death. death. But it isn't a death imposed by God. It's just no. the way things work. Yeah, sin sin, sin pays its wage. In another translation: sin pays its wage. The wage is death, okay? Much better translation. Yeah. Okay, you want to do Isaiah 64 I, there in Romans 3? Isaiah 64, verse 6. All of us have been sinful, even our best actions are filthy through, the, through and through. Because of our sins, we are like leaves that wither and are blown away by the wind. And then Romans 3, 23. Everyone is sin and is far away from God's saving presence. So I hope there's nobody out there who has a question about whether or not you're a sinner. Unfortunately, the children of Israel came to think that carrying out a mechanical following of God's will 
would save them. Even through the rest of their lives, were, were clearly contra even though the rest of their lives were clearly contrary to God's covenant. Their obedience was not the obedience based on faith, which is a true relationship with God, the Father, and the Son. So what is the difference between obedience that is not based on faith and obedience that is based on faith? Is one genuine while the other is fake? I think so. Yeah. Well, poor kids yeah. can't get to the point of a full understanding and appreciation of what, what God is if you're just mm -hmm. doing it out of drudgery and, and uh, mm -hmm. forced. We're, we're going to see, we're going to read more about that in just a moment. How can we make sure that our obedience is based on faith? Is our relationship with God, that is faith, the most important thing in our lives? Why is it so easy to slip into some pattern of works and think that we are saved? Paul had some words to say about that as well. I'm reading from Romans chapter 10, verse 3. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. That's from the New Revised Standard Version. What happens to people who try and earn their own way to heaven by following a legal religion? The spirit of bondage is engendered by seeking to live in accordance with legal religion through striving to fulfill the claims of the law in our own strength. Now, nobody in the Adventist church is trying to practice a legal religion, right? <laughs> One would hope not. <laughs> <laughs> is that the best you can say, Gary? <laughs> okay, well, go ahead. There is hope for us only as we come under the Abrahamic covenant, which is the covenant of grace by faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel preached to Abraham through which he had hope was the same gospel that is preached to us today, through which we have hope. Abraham looked unto Jesus, who is also the author and the finisher of our faith. And that's by Ellen G. White and Youth Instructor in 1892. Okay, we've sort of forgotten about the Youth Instructor. That was a young people's I magazine. That. I remember it very well. I yeah, that. It. That was intended for the, for the young people. Yeah. So, so that's her instructions to the young people. So do we love our neighbors because we are required to do so? Or because we love following the example of Jesus? Hmm. Does not desire, d d God does not desire the type of obedience that springs from fear or obligation. And I want you to notice these two very, very significant quotations from Ellen White, two different places. Jim? A man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so, excuse me, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey when the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they are cut across the human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of our righteousness... All is, righteousness, yeah. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. Ellen White's Christ Objects Lesson, page 97. Going on to 98. 98, yeah. Okay, so what does that passage say? That passage says, if you do it because you think you have to, it's not obedience. There's another quote, Ellen Hyde, I think it's attributed to her, sullen submission. We're going to get there in just a moment. Okay. <laughs> don't, don't rush us too fast here. Okay. So real obedience happens when you say, I really, I look at the life of Jesus, I see what he did, uh, that is my goal, that's what I want to be like. Right. I, I choose to do that because it's the right thing to do. Okay? Now you can read your passage. Okay. Jim? A sullen submission to the will of the Father will develop a character of a rebel. By okay, such so let's, let's, let's analyze that sentence for a moment. A sullen submission to the will of the Father. You think you've got to do it, right? Will, doesn't say maybe, 
perhaps will develop a character, the character of a rebel. God doesn't okay. want to pummel anybody into submission. That's right. By such a one service, by such a one service, is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is me mere mechanical performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. His rebellion is smothered, ready to a break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Ellen White, Signs of the Times, July 22, 1897. Okay. Now, it's very interesting when you look at that passage, you, you can look at all the part that's not boldened, and you say that's what appears in the later books. They leave out the key passage. If he dared, such a one would disobey. So is his heart really with God? Is his heart really with obedience? No. no. He wishes he could obey. I mean, he wishes he could disobey. He wishes he could do the things he's not supposed to do, but oh, he's going to, yeah, okay, I, I'll do it. You know? That person is not obeying. In fact, what he's doing, he's developing the character of a rebel. And who was the great first great rebel? Satan. Satan, Satan himself. So that person is follow, exactly following the example of Satan. God repeatedly told the children of Israel how he would bless them if they would just maintain the right, that right relationship with him. And there's long passages, Leviticus 26, 3 through 13, Deuteronomy 28, 1 through 15, great passages that talk about what God would have done for them if they just obeyed. So now let me ask you a very, a very practical question. What did God promise them? If they obeyed, what would happen? You're talking, we're talking about clear back at the time of, yeah. the, of the, the Israelites. We're talking Israelites. about yeah. What? Take them to the promised land and, and okay. Take care and, of them. and what would happen? What would they? How would they prosper? Well, they'd prosper, and their health would be good, and and uh, they'd live in peace and quietude. He looked after them. Well, there's, there's some more specifics in that. Let me look at this. Did God actually change the fertility of the animals based on how the Israelites were serving him? He said, your, your, your animals are going to have more children. Your crops are going to be more fertile. What did God do? Or is there some other reason why crops and animals were prospering or failing? Well, and, and what he was doing there, in, in contrast to the uh, pagan uh, fertility yeah. rites, he said, I'm going to do it for you. Yeah. So, uh, and, and what, what do the pagan religions do? They, they're into the fertility. They're, uh, they thought they were prospering through yeah. the old old Yeah, that's great. A great uh, and story. The, the, the perfect story, illustration of that is the story of Elijah. These people believed with, uh, with Ahab and Jezebel there. Jezebel was the, came from the, one of the capitals of fertility cult worship. And she married Ahab and she says, okay, we, she came as a great missionary. She's gonna, she was con absolutely determined that she was going to convert all of the northern kingdom of, of, of Israel to be fertility cult worshipers. And she had those 850 prophets some of them for prophets of Ashtoreth, some were prophets of Baal that worked for her. And it was their job to convince everybody that this was the right thing to do. And so what did God do? Send one man, <laughs> Elijah, marched into, the, into Ahab's off, uh, throne room there and said, you think you're in control? You think you're in charge of fertility? There will be no rain until I say so. Bye. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and where did, uh, anyway, I love that story. Yes. After going to the, the brook, brook Cherith and then things finally dried there, where did, where did Elijah go to? Do you remember? Well, he ran to, after he killed the, the prophets? No, no. This is after, after, when oh, the... Oh, yeah, he went down to the... the widow look yeah. after him. Okay, up. and where was, where was the widow living? Do you remember? The long name is Zarephath. Do you know where Zarephath is located? 
the north somewhere, wasn't it? The right next to Jezebel's father. <laughs> yes, yeah. <laughs> You people, you fertility cult people, you think you're in charge here? Well, let me, let me, you know, I, I don't know whether God has a sense of humor, but it sure seems like it. Yeah. And, and Ahab and Jezebel says, find that guy. They went to all the nations around, find that guy. We're going to bring him back and we're going to force him to do, you know, whatever, whatever. So he hides, he hides right under the nose of Jezebel's father. Wow. Well, in many places in the Old Testament, God tried to emphasize to the Israelites that they were not only his, not his only children. He repeatedly suggested that the whole earth was his, and the children of Israel were supposed to be reaching out to all the other children of God. So who created the earth? Who will recreate it in the end? God will. Yeah. Who controls what happens in and to the earth? Who is responsible for global warming, volcanoes, earthquakes, floods, and droughts? Are we going to blame God for all of that? Many of our Christian friends, and I'm sorry to say many Seventh-day Adventists, have come to think of God as a harsh dictator up in heaven. They believe that if, Jesus, if God the Son, Jesus Christ, was not constantly pleading with the Father, He might lose His temper and zap all of us. And so they constantly focus on being forgiven. They believe that if God has forgiven them, then he will not zap them. But is that a correct picture of what is going on in heaven? No. Nope. Absolutely not. We know that everyone is forgiven. God is forgiveness personified. But God's forgiveness does not guarantee our salvation. The soldiers who are nailing Jesus to the cross were forgiven, but they certainly were not eternally saved. Luke 23, 34, Jesus said, Forgive them, Father, they don't know what they are doing. Here is God the Son being nailed to the cross, and he's saying, what? Forgive them. Yep. Forgive them. Uh, you think he was authorized of the Father to say that? Absolutely, he was God himself, right? And he was under a lot of pain. We know what happened to the children of Israel. They essentially ignored or failed to understand God's covenant offer of grace. But we do not need to follow their example of failure. When God first brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, he said that, we, that he would treat them like an eagle treats its young. How does an eagle treat its young? It's young, I'm sorry, Jim. When an eagle wants to teach its little ones to fly, it prods them prods one of their little eaglets with its beak, noses it out of the nest. The eaglet starts to fall, and the great eagle flies underneath, puts, it, puts its wings under, excuse me, puts its wings out and catches the little one on its back and flies a mile into the air. Wow. Yeah, think about this. This is incredible. Go ahead. When you can hardly see the eagle as a point in the sky, it turns sideways and down falls the little one, the little eaglet, which goes fluttering maybe a thousand feet. Meanwhile, the eagle circling around the eaglet and not underneath it, the eaglet, excuse me, the eagle catches the eaglet on its wings and carries the eaglet up into the air again. After dishing the eaglet out again and letting it go, the eaglet comes down farther and farther, sometimes within a hundred feet of the ground. Again, the great eagle catches the little one on its back and up they go another mile. Little by little, the eaglet will learn to fly. The eagle knows when the eaglet is tired, it spoons the eaglet into the nest, nose down, nose the out. Noses out of the next one and starts off again. <laughs> what a story. <laughs> that's something? That's a great one. Really, yeah. That's quoted in our adult Bible study. Uh, old teacher Sabbath School Bible study guide for page 93. So, how does God do? With his sharp talons of grace, the mountain eagle of eternity prodded the Hebrew eaglet from the haughty nest of Egyptian oppression. At the Red Sea, the eaglet plummeted into panic when it heard the desert for thunder with the ensuing ch chariot wheels of injustice. As the eaglet's faith fluttered, it, be, it beheld two massive, gaping water walls that rose in glorious attention, saluting the majest, majestic eagle's omnipotence. 
Between the lucid water walls, a dry highway had been carved out in supernatural fashion, pointing the trembling leaglet to safe passage. That's from our adult Sabbath school te Bible study guide, teacher's guide, page 93 again. Wow. Um, we know, now let's sort of summarize here. We've got a minute or two left here. Uh, Exodus 19, we've looked at 7 and 8. Let me read it to you again. So Moses went down and called the leaders of the people together and told them everything that the Lord had commanded him. Then all the people answered, and would we Adventists say the same thing? We will do everything that the Lord has said. And Moses reported this to the Lord. Wouldn't we do that today? Human nature is not, doesn't change all that much, does it? Well, in Exodus 32, and that's the story of the golden calf, we read of the terrible sin at the foot of Mount Sinai. While the cloud of God and His glory were hovering over the top of the mountain, right there, I mean, it's a few thousand feet. You can, you can easily see it up there. At the bottom of that mountain, some of the Israelites were dancing, drunk and naked around a golden calf in a regular fertility cult ceremony. Not only that, but also they called it a festival to honor Yahweh. A festival to honor Yahweh. When God told Moses what was happening, Moses pleaded with Yahweh and in effect said, if you allow your people to perish, what will the Egyptians think? You must change your mind and stop being angry. Remember your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I see that our time is running out, but uh, you know, Moses went back down the mountain. He dropped those tables of stone. Um, and then he ground up the little, the, the thing, the golden calf and made them drink it. And then he goes back to God and he says, please forgive them. And if you cannot forgive them, remove my name. And God says, no, only the names of those who've sinned against me will be removed. Uh, so what can we conclude from all of this? It is our works. It's not, uh, it's not faith and works that saves us. It's our works when they are correctly motivated by a true faith that demonstrate that faith that leads to salvation. Has God entered into a contract with the Seventh-day Adventist Church? If so, if so, what does that contract say? I'm going to leave that question with you. I want you to think about it. It's a serious question. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have taken up some challenging questions here, and we've learned some interesting things about the story of the children of Israel, how they were preserved from just melting into Canaanite society or maybe into Egyptian society. And we've learned how all that happened. Uh, we've learned about what happened at the foot of Mount Sinai. Lord, forgive us where we have failed. We're not dancing drunk and naked around a golden calf, but we have our own foibles as well. Help us to see you and to recognize you and to invite you into our lives. Each day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.